Last week, I stood before you during our time of prayer, shaking as I shared the updated news that there were not 20 people killed in the gay nut club in the wee hours of the morning, as originally reported, but 49 people killed. 49 people killed by a hate-filled man wielding a semi-automatic weapon, a self-radicalized man who proclaimed allegiance to ISIS right before the attack, but who was an American citizen, born in New York and living in Florida. I must confess this has been a hard week to get any work done. I spent a great deal of time going over my news feed, reading the reflections of my friends and family in the LGBTQ community, listening to their anguish and fear and desperate attempts to choose love in the face of such hatred, reaching out when I could, sharing messages of love and comfort. There were pleas from some to not use this massacre as a means to pit two marginalized groups in our country, the LGBTQ community and the Muslim community, against one another. It's been an inspirational week as I've read stories of solidarity between these two groups. In one community, a gay minister shared that the first clergy to reach out to him in the wake of the Orlando shooting was the imam from his local mosque. I learned that in Tulsa, there is a history of the LGBTQ and Muslim communities showing up for one another whenever one or the other group is the target of hate. <clears throat> I read speeches by some who confessed their former poor treatment of gay people and then publicly apologized for that bad behavior. It's been a galvanizing week as I've seen allies all over the country speak out or sing out their solidarity and love for the LGBTQ community. <coughs> Over the past few weeks, we have been in the midst of a sermon series, The Answer to Bad Religion is Not No Religion, a guide to good religion for speakers, skeptics, and believers. In the book of the same title, the author characterizes, highlights characteristics of bad religion. And to be sure, some of those characteristics play a role in Sunday's mass shooting. But lest we give in to the temptation to lay all of the blame at the feet of the religion practiced by the shooter, let me remind you that we live in a city where it was Christian communities of faith that bolstered the repeal of the non-discrimination ordinance in April of 2015, removing protections for those in the LGBT community as far as employment, housing, and public services are concerned. We live in a country where the response to the Supreme Court decision in favor of marriage equality last June has been a rash of hysterical anti-LGBT bills. And that's not an exaggeration. There have been over 100 bills discussed in this past year and debated in states across the country. As one internet meme pointed out, you say, how can this tragedy happen? It happened because Omar Mateen Tate was born and bred in America, not overseas. Just two weeks ago, you were calling trans women child predators. One year ago, you were saying that our marriages shouldn't be recognized. Six years ago, you were saying that gay men and women couldn't die for their country. Ten years ago, you told us we didn't deserve job protection. Thirteen years ago, it took Lawrence versus Texas to decriminalize our sex lives. Eighteen years ago, you took Matthew Shepard. Twenty-three years ago, you took Brandon Tina. Thirty-six years ago, the American government began their five years of silence as 10,000 gay men were massacred by the AIDS virus. Forty-three years ago, we were still considered mentally ill. And 47 years ago, the riots of Stonewall began. For centuries, this country has bred homophobia into our history, in our schools, and into the very fabric of society. Omar Mateen was the product of American hate. America, you taught him this and even told him the time to do it. Islam does not have the monopoly on anti-LGBT sentiments and behavior, and it's time for America to look in the mirror and see the ways it has contributed to tragedies like the one that took place last Sunday morning. I was listening to a podcast last week, and those on the panel were discussing the shooting and the fact that the shooter was Muslim. 
One person said that fundamentalist Christians may stand on the streets with hate-filled signs to protest against and spew hatred toward the LGBTQ community, but it is only Muslims who would perpetrate a violent act like the Orlando shooting against those they abhor. I'm here to tell you that while that there may not be cases of fundamentalist Christians entering a nightclub with semi-automatic rifles to kill and maim innocent people, the hateful rhetoric spewed forth from their mouths and their pulpits, the rhetoric spewed forth the, to the members who are in the LGBTQ community, has taken many more lives than those that were taken at Pulse last Sunday morning. Those sermons of hate, words of judgment and damnation from a God who they claim loathes a certain segment of our society, has placed guns in the hands of untold members of the LGBT community and all but pulled the trigger, taking precious lives through suicide. Don't tell me that the anti-LGBT rhetoric of fundamentalist Christianity doesn't kill because it does. A friend of mine wrote a post earlier this week trying to explain to her straight friends and family the reality of being a gay woman in the United States of America. These are her words. Here's the thing you need to understand about every LGBT person in your life. We've spent most of our lives being aware that we are at risk. When LGBT folks say it could have been here, it could have been me. They aren't exaggerating. I don't care how long you've been out or how far down your road to self-acceptance and love you've traveled. All of us are always aware that we are at some level of risk. When I reach to hold my wife's hand in the car, I still do the mental calculation of, okay, that car is slightly behind us so they can't see, but that truck to my left can see inside the car. If I even think about kissing her in public, I'm never fully in the moment. I'm always parsing who is around us and paying attention to us. There's a tension that comes with that. A literal tensing of the muscles that brace me for potential danger. For a lot of us, it's become such an automatic reaction that we don't even think about it directly anymore. We just do it. And then, over the last few years, it started to fade a little. It started to feel like maybe things were getting better. A string of Supreme Court decisions, public opinion shifting to the side of LGBT rights. Life was getting better. You could breathe a little. I've had some time to adjust to the idea that people hate us enough to kill us. Matthew Shepard was my first real lesson in that. So this weekend was a sudden slap in the face. A reminder that I should never have let my guard down, should never have gotten complacent, because it could have been me, my wife, my friends. Every LGBT person you know knows what I'm talking about. Those tiny little mental calculations we do over the course of our life add up. And this past weekend hit us with a stark reminder that those simmering concerns, those fears, they probably won't ever go away. Additionally, now we just got a lesson that expressing our love could result in the death of others, completely unrelated to us. It's easy to take risks when it's you, and you've made that choice. Now there's this subtext that you could set off someone who killed other people who weren't even involved. And that's a lot. But we will be doing those mental calculations for the rest of our lives. Those little PDAs you take for granted with your spouse, they come with huge baggage for us. So do me a favor. Reach out to that LGBT person you know and let them know you are thinking of them and you love them. That will mean the world to them right now. I promise. As I reflect on the great ways the LGBTQ community has been harmed in the name of faith, in the name of Christianity, I feel shame for these practices of bad religion. And when we feel that, it is tempting to turn one's back on faith when so much damage has been done in its name. But instead, I try to hold on to the very best aspects of faith. The teachings of love and inclusion shown by Jesus Christ. 
the prophetic voices crying out in Hebrew scriptures like Isaiah, Jeremiah, and the Amos, as we heard read this morning. Voices that shed light on the injustices in their world and proclaimed a different way in the name of God. Good religion does not stay silent in the face of injustice and hatred. I have long been an ally of the LGBTQ community. I grew up in an open and affirming congregation. I had two, youth, two gay youth group leaders, and I have lifelong friends who are gay. I do what I can, and I speak and act in love and support for the LGBTQ community. But there was something in my friend's post that galvanized me to do something more. With it being Pride Week, I wanted to do something special, to declare my love and support in a way that would be clear to all who saw. So I made a sign. A sign inspired by the benediction we say at the end of every Sunday morning worship here at Brentwood Christian Church. And I thought it was important that everyone would know that I'm a clergy person saying this. Someone raised in the church. Someone following the way of Jesus. Someone trained in the Bible and theology. And so I made a sign that said, As a pastor, I want you to know that you are loved beyond your wildest imagination, just as you are. I'm going to place this sign up here. As you can see, my sign has bold letters and bright colors because I've been to Pride Fest over the years and I've seen signs of hate held up with bold letters that tore down and demeaned the LGBTQ community. And so I took my sign with me and carried it as I walked in the Equality March yesterday morning. And then I set it up at the Brentwood booth for all who walked by to see. One woman stopped by with her wife to color one of the affirmation cards we had on the table. And after she finished coloring, she said, I have to tell you, thank you so much for this sign. Thank you for saying this, for showing us that the church can have a message of love for us. Because too often all we've heard is a message of hate and rejection. She started to cry as she told me of how the church she and her wife attended, the church her wife grew up in, had kicked them out of the ministry they were an integral part of, and how after that they had been asked to leave the church. How one of the women of the church tried to give them a hug and she said, we are just saying these things and doing this out of love for you. Tears came to my own eyes as she said, this message of real love you're sharing, it is so needed. Thank you for being here. She and I hugged and cried. Person after person came to our booth telling us how happy they were to see a message of love and welcome coming from the church. Throughout the morning and over the noon hour, we've seen signs of protesters spreading a message of fear, judgment, and hate. But it seemed like they weren't making a big disturbance at first, and people throughout the time were coming over and having conversations with them, and it was all very peaceful. But it seemed after a while I could hear shouting, and I thought, okay, it's time to take my sign of love out to the streets. If there are going to be signs of hate out there, I want to make sure my sign of love is in that space for all to see. So I made my way to the heart of the square, following the raised voices of the preacher shouting out hellfire and damnation for my LGBTQ friends and family. I walked into the crowd that was gathered and held my sign high. Between that and my shirt that said, as a Christian, I am sorry for the narrow-minded, judgmental, deceptive, manipulative actions of those who have denied right and equality to so many in the name of God. I made quite the counter-display to the yelling preacher. Some cried out to the preacher, that isn't speaking in love, this is. As she gestured toward me, people started clapping. And then one by one, total strangers came up to me, hugging me, some with huge smiles, some with tears in their eyes, some with wavering voices, as they thanked me for standing in love, as they told me stories of how their churches had rejected them or their loved ones. It was incredible, the need for people to hear that message of love, especially in the wake of Orlando, 
when their illusions of security were shattered with gunfire and their fears were ripped wide open. If we are to practice good religion, we must have a prophetic voice. We must not stay silent in the face of hate. We must not stay silent in the towering shadows of those who might try to bully us into keeping our mouths shut. We must not stay silent when people respond, now let's not get political. For too long we have allowed the accusation that we are venturing into the territory of politics to keep us quiet. It's time we realize the politicization of every issue that actually matters was done on purpose to divide and conquer, to silence the masses and stymie change. We must not stay silent in the barrage of attacks on the transgender community through bathroom legislation. We must not stay silent when 49 people are killed and 53 injured in a mass shooting at a gay nightclub. We must not stay silent when it seems that a person's right to own a semi-automatic rifle is more important than another person's right to dance with their friends without fear of being gunned down. The time for silence is over. We've held vigils and they were necessary. We need time to mourn, time to grieve the devastating loss of life, but these deaths must not end in our silence. It's time our nation woke up to the culture of hate for the LGBTQ community that has been bred for far too long. Our scripture reading for this morning is one I go back to time and again when I wrestle with issues of injustice in our world. The prophet Amos says to us, I hate, I despise your festivals and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals, I will not look upon. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your harps, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. In the face of injustice, Amos cried out. In the wake of exploitation of the poor, Amos was not silent. Amos decried the solemn assemblies where people offered prayers and burnt offerings, but he saw that nothing ever changed. He saw that their action ended with their prayers rather than began with them. Theologian Karl Barth got it right when he said, to clasp the hands in prayer is the beginning of an uprising against the disorder of the world. So may we go from our candlelight vigils as people change. May we go from our moments of silence as people transformed. May we go from our houses of worship with our mighty voices raised proclaiming a message of hope and love for all of God's people. Voices raised proclaiming an end to hate and fear and war. Voices raised celebrating the dignity and worth of every human being. And perhaps with our voices raised, we will begin to see justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Thanks be to God.